So let me just pray. Father, would you help me, God, in my fogginess of my head and, and not feeling on, on point today? Lord, would your word come through regardless? God, would you speak to us? Lord, I believe that um, everyone is here on purpose this morning. Everyone tuning in online is here for a reason. And God, we don't want to come and just do church. Lord, we want to come and encounter Jesus. Lord, we want to come and find you in a very real way to have our hearts and our lives and our actions and our words transformed to be more like you. God, would you meet us where we're at? Lord, would you remove any hindrance from us hearing your word this morning? And would you give us open hearts to receive it and minds to receive it in Jesus' name? Everybody said? Amen. 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 So I don't know about you, but I will say this. I think freedom is a pretty awesome thing. Uh, specifically, I think the United States is not perfect, but in terms of trying to figure out how to govern the world, democracy has done a pretty good job in offering us a, a good life with freedom that a lot of people here on earth could not even imagine to live in. Now, I'm not saying our country is perfect or great by any means. We obviously have some stuff going on, but I've traveled a lot. I've lived over in Europe seven years of my life. I've been lucky enough to travel on business internationally extensively. I've seen a lot of our world. And when you travel, here's what you get to see when you come back. You get to realize just how blessed we are. Not perfect, but blessed. And we're blessed to have this thing called freedom, which a lot of the world doesn't know how to experience. And, and you know, we can just say this, you know, we're not perfect, but democracy has been copied by countless countries in the last century all over the planet because until Jesus comes back as the king and sets up his rulership, it's the best thing we've found so far. It's not perfect. But, you know, in one of the country's founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, which kind of led us into this democracy and this freedom we get to enjoy, there's some fundamental ideas that are stated and I just want to read what it says here. It's worth repeating in the Declaration of Independence. It says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, dramatic pause, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness. Now, there's some, there's some good stuff there. I'm not being political. I'm just sharing about some of the foundations of our country. See, the founding fathers had this belief that we're all created equal, and it definitely took the United States some time to figure that out in terms of equality with men and different uh, women, excuse me, voting rights and, and, and race, race issues in our country. But we're, we're figuring it out. But here's the thing. This idea that we have these rights come from this uh, concept that we're made in the image of God. And therefore, we have certain God-given rights. And among these rights are freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's an interesting one. The last one to me is interesting. The, the pursuit of happiness. I even think there was a movie made with that title in it. Now, let's just pause there for a second and say this. If you go to your average person, who probably doesn't follow Jesus and just is trying to live life, and you go, hey, what do you want out of life? Like, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to have in your life? A, a very common answer is this, man, I just want to be happy. I, I'd love to have a little bit of peace, and I'd love to be happy. And guess what? That's not bad. Because you know why? Because I'd love to be happy too. Happiness is not a, a bad thing. And I think if we're honest with ourselves at one level or another, a lot of us just want to be happy have a little peace in our lives. And I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't something I desire for my own life. But today, I want to do something with us. I want to take us on a journey. See, we're starting a brand new series that's entitled, Things Jesus Never Said. Things Jesus Never Said. And, and I didn't get this idea for this series on my own. I'm always just very transparent with you. Uh, there's a very large church that allows people to use their resources. And, and I found this series, it's an Easter series leading up to Easter Sunday. And, and, and I'm going to take the big ideas from it. My sermons will be radically different than the sermons that this church preached. But I love this concept. And here's the concept. Often a way to learn very well is this. You do a contrasting methodology. In order to learn what is true, 
you learn what is not true. And learn, in order to learn what is good and right, oftentimes you have to encounter what is not good and right. And that's something I've learned. I'm committed to be a lifelong learner. It's one of my passions in life is to never stop learning. And I've learned a valuable way to learn is to, d- to get these contrasting things. For example, I don't know about you, but how many of you would just want to say, I probably need to start eating better and a little healthier than I do now? Like, I know that, right? That's stuck in my mind. I know I need to change my diet, but I have a, an addiction to frozen pizzas from Costco. I don't want to make you stumble, but if you've never had a Kirkland brand frozen pizza, good times. I'm just saying, so I know what I need to do, but here's what happened. About a month ago, I got fed up. Do you ever have those red lines that you pass? And I finally got to the point where I'm like, if I have any more ramen, another frozen pizza, I'm going to keel over. I feel horrific. And I hit that red line of what not to do, and it kind of spun me back into going, I need to get a handle on my diet, and I'm trying intermittent fasting, and I'm not going to tell you how good I'm doing at it, but I'm at least trying, right? So sometimes in order to know where you need to go, you kind of have to know where not to go. So with that being said, let's just touch base on a few things today, and I want to be very clear here because things can be misinterpreted. These are things Jesus never said, okay? Go to this next slide. Go into all the world and preach whatever makes you happy. Say this. He never said that. Repeat that with me. He never said that. True, true story. Next one. Whoever wants to be my disciple must affirm themselves, avoid the cross, and just follow their own hearts. Say that with me. He never said that. He never said that. He never said it. Uh, Last one. Ask and it will be given to you because God is your cosmic sugar daddy. (laughs) He never said that. He never said that. Matt, do you want me to turn this off and try the handheld instead? Do you want me to? Check one, check two. There we go. Little technical difficulties, but nothing we can't handle here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody give it up for Matt this morning. Matt, you're killing it. Now, let's be clear. Jesus never said those things. I was so worried about this. I'm like, someone's going to soundbite this, and they're going to be like, Emmanuel Baptist Church is in heresy. Did you just see what that pastor preached? But Jesus never said those things. You know, but, but let me go back to this idea about happiness. You know, There may be some churches that actually could kind of lean you that way, and you would think that you listen to the way they preach and they present stuff, you would think maybe that's what Jesus asks us to do. But let me go back. You know, I'm I'm proud to be an American. I really am. I grew up, I have a real rich heritage in my family of military serving and all these things. Um, Again, I'm not saying America's perfect by any means, and let me be very clear, we're in desperate need of revival right now. Let me just say that. There's no doubt. But, you know, this God-given right to pursue happiness, what about that thing? What what does that mean? Because we all want to pursue happiness at one level or another, but here's the thing about pursuing happiness. When your goal is to pursue happiness, man, you can find yourselves in some gnarly situations. Gnarly is a Greek word for not good. Some really gnarly situations. Like, I don't know about you, but in your pursuit of trying to find happiness, have you found yourselves in situations that you're like, this is no bueno, this did not work out, Um, bad, abort, let me get out of here, eject, this is not heading the right direction. I have, for sure, much more than just frozen pizzas from Costco. And I want to take you to a story in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, where we find a very similar setting. You may not see it right away, but I'm going to point it out to you. There was someone who was trying to pursue something and found themselves in a horrific situation. So go there with me. We're going to have it up on the screens for you if you want to follow along. John chapter 8, starting in verse 2 to the first half of verse 6. Here's what happened. This is an amazing story, by the way. At dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, 
Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order for having a basis for accusing him. Now, this is a scene that's just played out in front of us right here. Jesus is getting popular. His teaching, he's a rabbi. Again, keep in mind, he's in the temple courts. His, his following is growing. His disciples are there. His followers are there. I'm sure their mind is just getting blown by his teachings about the kingdom and the wisdom he's dispensing. And in the midst of this scene, the Pharisees come in and throw this woman into their midst. Now, she was caught in the act of adultery. Again, there's a Greek word for that, gnarly. And they throw this woman into her midst. Now, we don't know exactly how that plays out, but if she was caught in the act of adultery, the likelihood that she may not have been fully clothed or dressed or had time, who knows what it looks like, but what we do know this, this is a bad scene unfolding in front of Jesus. This is not good. By far, you can imagine this woman is trembling in fear and in shame it's a terrible thing that's taking place. And so she's right there, and the Pharisees are not really trying to seek justice for the law of God being broken. They have one agenda alone. They care nothing about this woman at all. They want to trap Jesus. And so here's what they do. They ask him a question. They say, hey, Jesus, we caught her in the act. The law of Moses, the rules of God say this, she needs to be stoned. Let me clarify something. That's with rocks, not the other kind of stoned. You need to clarify that in Arizona sometimes. With rocks, giant rocks, picking up and stoning people. And so they're seeing if Jesus is going to break the rules. They've, they've put Jesus in their minds in a conundrum. Because here's the problem. If he says, well, we're not going to stone her, then he's not a follower of the law. He's not really a good rabbi. And now he's breaking the law by saying that. So they're putting him in this predicament. But Jesus also has a reputation of being full of love and grace and justice and mercy. So what are you going to do, Jesus? If you say we have to stone her and kill her, then your reputation for being a man full of grace, a man full of love, a man full of, of mercy is going to be gone. But if you don't, then we know that you're not the follower of the law. So they've put them in, in this pickle. And, and I'm assuming this is the worst moment for this woman in her entire life. This is horrific. Not only was she caught in a shameful act, she's now, clearly she knows she's about to be killed. This is terrible. So let's continue to see what happens in, in this story. In verse 6, the second half in, in John chapter 8, here's how Jesus, his initial reaction to this. Again, the woman's standing there, probably trembling in fear about to be stoned, the Pharisees accusing, asking what's going to happen, the glares, the people probably startled about what's happening. So what is Jesus' response? But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now that's odd. I don't know how you want to cut it. That's a weird way to respond to this. We've heard the story so much, if you've grown up in church, we know how it plays out. But if you think about that, that's a strange way to respond. It's just to get down, start doing this. I'm sure it kind of threw the Pharisees off a little bit. Now, that is an odd thing, but if you, you've got to see the scene. Jesus is riding in the sand, a bunch of Pharisees standing around. By the way, they're not throwing rocks. They're throwing rocks, like giant, think small boulder. That's the, what they're holding in their hands, and they're ready to roll. And Jesus is just riding there in the dirt. What is he doing? What is he riding? Now, we'll never know on this side of heaven exactly what he wrote. We won't. We won't know until we get to heaven and go, Jesus, what in the world did you write in the sand? We, we would like to know. But I would say we have a pretty decent clue as to what he wrote. And let me share why I believe that. There's two Greek words for the word write. So he was writing in the sand. There's two Greek words. One is the word write, where you would just write something out. And the other one is this word. Let me see if I can pronounce it correctly. Katagraphen is the other Greek word for writing. And it means to write against. Specifically, to write a record against someone. 
So again, we don't know for sure, but the probability that he bent down and started writing out the sins of the Pharisees in the dirt is a very high probability, especially when you see how the story unfolds. So again, you have these self-righteous Pharisees with stones in hands. They're waiting, oh, we got Jesus now. What is he going to do? And they look down and they're going, oh, he knows about those Costco pizzas. Oh, he knows about my browser history on the internet just this last week. Oh, man, he, he knows that I cheated my neighbor. And they're starting to read this, right? And you can imagine the dynamic shifting pretty dramatically at this point. It's all playing out in real time. Look at what Jesus does. He just cuts through their accusations. In verse 7, he says this, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Fascinating. They show up with a question for Jesus. The law of Moses says this, what are you going to do? Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, just turns the tables on them. All of a sudden now, they're reading their sins in the dirt, and the tables have been turned on them. And now Jesus is asking them a question. Anyone of you who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Now here's the conundrum they're in. If they chuck a stone, they're saying they're perfectly holy. And now they're in violation of the law. It's just brilliance. I mean, this is just absolutely brilliant what Jesus does here. So what happens next? Verses 8 through 11. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I love that. He asked him a question. Whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. He goes back down and starts writing even more sins. I find it interesting that the ones that dropped their stones first were the older ones. And you know, in my experience, the older I get, the more I realize I don't have it together. I think the older you get, if you're walking humbly and mercifully, you realize just how jacked up you are apart from Jesus. If you don't, you're probably getting your heart hardened like a Pharisee. So the older ones left first because they just knew, oh man, I, I can't. I can't throw a stone. I, I know how sinful I am. But eventually everybody left. Thump. 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 The stones are just dropping to the ground. No one condemned her. From her most fearful and shameful moment, Jesus brings her into freedom. It's incredible. Just brings her into freedom. He says, who's condemned you? No one, sir. He says, neither do I condemn you. Man, that is just beautiful right there. Some of y'all need to hear that this morning. When Jesus looks at you, he says, neither do I condemn you. That's, that's an amazing statement from Jesus right there. But see, that could have been the end of the story, just like Jesus says, hey, you're good, let you off the hook, love you, we'll see you later, but, that, but you're, you, you don't need to forget something here. Something very clearly happens at the end of the story, I, and I think it's worth paying attention to. First of all, I want us to think about what led this woman to commit adultery. Like, do you think she just got up one morning and said, today feels like a good day to die? You know, I just feel like being completely reckless at the point of taking my own life and probably getting stoned. I don't think the lady did that. I don't think she woke up and said, you know, today I feel like being inherently sinful and evil. I'm just going to go do whatever. No, I doubt that happened either. Again, we don't know. But, but here's the likelihood of what happened. She was searching for something. She was searching for acceptance, for love, for affirmation. Maybe your husband was a complete jerk to her. And she knew this guy, and this guy was super kind to her and said all the nice things and even, even recognized she had her hair dyed the week before, and my husband didn't even know my hair was dyed. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sure she felt herself in that situation because she was pursuing something. And I would imagine in that pursuit, there's a pursuit of happiness. She's just trying to find fulfillment 
in life. And instead, she found herself about to have her life taken away from her. But see, Jesus doesn't say, hey, I know where you're at. You are just following your heart. You just go on, you're free now, and continue to follow your heart, because if you do that, everything's going to work out just fine. He did not say that, did he? What did he say? He said, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. Right before that, he said this. He says, I don't condemn you either. See, we often want Jesus who doesn't condemn us. But all the time, we don't necessarily want the Jesus who says, now go now and leave your life of sin. We love justice and merciful and grace-filled Jesus. I do, to be clear, love that aspect of Jesus. We don't always love the aspect of Jesus that stares us in the eyes and says, stop it. That thing you're doing, stop it. Go and leave it. It's time to repent and turn. You see, that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus does. See, Jesus knew something about this woman, the motives for her heart. More than likely, she was pursuing something, maybe pursuing happiness, and that brought her to a place, but it brought her to a place where there was severe consequences. And let me bring you to my point of this story. Here's the thing about sin. Sin promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God. Man, sin promises satisfaction but it comes at a cost of being disobedient to God. Now, sin promises satisfaction. If you're sitting here this morning and go, oh, pastor, I don't believe in that at all. I'm like, you don't know how to sin very well. You're not good at it. Sin does promise satisfaction in the short term. You know, for many years, I've had people go, I had no idea why anybody would go out and do drugs I have an addiction history in my past. I don't know why anybody would touch those things. Because they're fun. For a while. Until the price comes calling. Seriously, I have had many people, I have no idea why people would, because they're fun. They make you feel good. Revelation, the problem is, you get the whirlwind of all those actions heaped upon you. We can talk about drugs, but... I mean, the same thing with porn. Same thing with control and same thing with how you treat your people at work. It offers temporary satisfaction, but it eventually brings us into disobedience with God. See, let me, let me share something with you about sin. Because uh, sin has an aspect of appeal to it. Sin is just enticing us. If you want to be happy, you can be happy right now. Immediate gratification. It's right here for you. Come on and let's dance. But in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 25, this is talking about Moses. There's a little phrase here about sin I want to point out to us. This is talking about Moses and how he was separate and, and identifying with the Israel people, even though he was in the Egypt courts. He says this, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God ra rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Can you repeat that after me? Say, the fleeting pleasures of sin. I think that describes sin so well. Oftentimes when I talk to people who are struggling in their walk, it's the cost of following Jesus that's hard. As I've shared with you many times, there's nothing better than living a life for Jesus, but it's not easy. That, that walk will, should and will cost you. But it's the best life you could dream of. And it comes at a cost. And here's where the contrast is with, with sin. Sin offers you immediate gratification. You know, last week I talked about living for the eternal and how that should be a motive for us to live for eternal things. But the reality of that is it's often difficult for that to be a motivator in our heart because we're looking to the future, to the kingdom come, and sin is right there beckoning and saying, I got something for you right now. You don't need to wait to have sex until you're married. Have sex right now. You love them. It's okay. No big deal. The problem with that is when we violate God's ways, we don't get to experience the fullness of life that he's inviting us into. Again, we think sin is something that God wants us to refrain from because he's a cosmic killjoy and doesn't want us to have any fun, and he wants us to live this really rigid and boring life. But the reality is this. He's a good father, and he knows when we follow sin down the path, it will ultimately destroy us, and he's looking out for us. 
He's like the father of the toddler that's like, I want to touch the stove. I want to touch the stove. And you're like, you don't want to touch the stove. And then the father turns the back and the little kid touches the stove and goes, ow, oh my gosh, I got burned. I tried to tell you because I love you. Listen, God doesn't want you to sin, not because he's a killjoy, because he loves you. And he wants the best life for you. Father knows best. It's true. But here's the thing. God calls us into something called holiness that has to do with being apart from sin. I want to contrast some concepts for you this morning. Happiness and holiness. The pursuit of happiness can lead us into so many things. Uh, in my life, it has led me into so many terrible things with terrible consequences that I had to navigate over and over and over again. But God has a different calling for us as followers of Jesus. It's a higher road, and it's a better life. Let me read this verse to you out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. It says this, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Temporary residents. With the appeal of sin being temporary and alluring and satisfactory in the moment. Now, I have an interesting story about the scripture. I was a young, zealous believer, and I stumbled upon the scripture, and I was like, I'm going to memorize it. I was in college in Waco, Texas, and I wrote the scripture down on an index card, and I taped it to my dashboard, and I would drive around trying to memorize the scripture. And then, like a week later, my car got stolen, it got broken into, and it got, you know, taken for, I can't remember how many days it was gone, I filed a police report, but it was found a few days later in a parking lot across the city. The windows broken out, the whole nine yards. Well, I came in there, and, and I realized they had just kind of broken the steering wheel column and gone for a joyride or whatever else they did. But something that was interesting is that index card was removed and laid face down in the seat next to it. Never forget that. Just a random story about that scripture. That's what I relate to the scripture. But I remember memorizing that and going, okay, God's standard is that I'm holy. But if I'm honest with you, with my mouth I would have told you, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to pursue holiness. He's going to call us to holiness. We're going to be holy in everything we do. I had accountability out the wazoo. I lived with seven Christian guys. Accountability was everywhere. But guess what I learned? In my pursuit of holiness, sin really liked me. Sometimes I like sin. So I was struggling with this whole idea, and I remember coming back to this verse and going, that's ridiculous, God. I'm not going to say that to you, but my heart was saying it. Like, for reals? For realsies? Is that really what we're going to do? Like, be holy because I am holy. Like, I've tried, and I'm terrible at it. I've tried so hard to be holy, and I can do really good for like one day, five hours, two minutes, and 37 seconds. And then I'm not so hot because sin really seems to like me. Sometimes I like to sin because it's just immediate gratification. But I think when I read this now, there's a different understanding. See, when I read this when I was in college and I was a zealous young believer, when I read about holiness, here's what I interpreted it as. Perfect behavior. Perfect behavior. Now, obviously, there's an element of our behavior and holiness. You cannot separate that. But let me go back and just dissect what the Greek word of holiness actually means, because it means something different than perfect behavior. The word in Greek for holiness, I'm going to be reading a little bit up David Guzik, who's a, a preacher and a, and a theologian. I just liked what he had to say about what the biblical definition of holiness is. The main idea behind holiness is not moral purity, but it is the idea of being a part and separate from the world so we can be with God. He goes on to say that instead of building a wall around apartness where God is here and then we're there, God invites us into his holiness because of Jesus on the cross. We get to share his apartness from the world. God is holy, therefore he invites his sons and daughters to share his holiness, this relationship, this fellowship with him. And holiness simply means this. You come out of the world and you are different. 
You're separate. Yes, is there an aspect of morality in that? Of course. You need to walk with Jesus, of course. But the main idea isn't perfect behavior. It is being a part, separate, cleansed, set aside to be committed unto the Lord. See, there's an invitation that Jesus offers us. It's to separate ourselves to the world, not so we can look at the world and go, you guys are so bad and I am so good. I gave up Costco pizzas months ago, judging you harshly. That's not the idea. The idea is to come away from the world, to come and be with God. He is inviting us into relationship and to share his holiness. See, there's the pleasures of sin that are immediate. They're gratifying. I get it. Look, the temptations you're struggling with right now, they're not unusual. People have been navigating these things for thousands of years, and they have their appeal. And yes, often they offer you that immediate gratification for it, but then there's God just inviting us into holiness, which simply means this. We are to be separate from the world and to be with Jesus. See, there's all kinds of things that we chase after, and we're convinced, we're convinced they're going to bring us happiness. We're convinced they're going to bring us the new life. Those of you who are struggling with drugs and alcohol right now, you do it because you're trying to escape the pain. And you're trying to escape reality. And you're trying to find a little happiness. But what you're really looking for is Jesus. What you're really searching for is the Lord. See, in Jesus is the good life. Again, I think oftentimes God gets a bad rap. We look at him as the, as the buzzkill. You know, I want to follow Jesus. I really believe his teachings. And, man, I love the idea of salvation and the cross. And, you know, Christians are kind of weird, but I could probably handle them. But this idea of living a life and not being able to do whatever I want to do whenever I wanted to do it and living for myself is really hard. It is. And you should count the cost. I don't believe in cheap salvation. I believe Jesus paid it all for salvation. You can't earn it, but I believe before you sign up to walk with him, you should really take an inventory of what it's going to cost you. Too many people in American society are being offered a really free gospel that has no cost associated with it. Now, you can't earn his salvation. It's 100% free. Your job is to believe in the one that was sent, okay? But then Jesus says, hey, listen, when you sign up for that, take up your cross and follow me. And the cross is an instrument of death. Die to yourself, die to living for you, and come and follow me. And guess what happens when you do that? Here's the great news. And then you will find life, and you will find it to the full. I have a lot of regrets in my life, a ton of regrets. Every time I've said yes to Jesus and no to the world and my flesh, maybe it's not been easy, maybe it's been a struggle, but every time I've said yes to God and coming to be with him in this idea of holiness, I have never regretted it. I have tasted real life, real life is found in him. Let me me tell you this. Here's what I believe about holiness. Holiness and happiness are not independent from each other. They are interdependent. See, the world's happiness is fleeting. Like the author of Ecclesiastes goes through trying to find all these things in life, and he uses this analogy. It's like a chasing after the wind. And so many of us are just pursuing things, and it's like you think you got it, and maybe you got some temporary pleasure, then you try to hold on to it, and it's just gone. You know what I think is hilarious? When you see a movie, people fall in love, and they just go, I met this person, and really, I can't believe it. They're perfect. They complete me. Gag. There's literally no person besides Jesus that can do that. Like if you're going to put all your hope and all your trust and all your expectations in a human being, it's just a short countdown until you are wholly disappointed. If you don't believe me, just ask people who've been married for a long time and say, how was your first year of marriage? Oh, Lord. I found out they were not perfect. And they did not complete me. In fact, sometimes I wanted to push them out of bed in the morning. So why would we pursue holiness, really? Like, I'm contrasting happiness and holiness. Like, what's the appeal there, preacher? Preacher, man, you're trying to tell me to pursue holiness instead of immediate gratification. That is not a good sell, sir. That's not an easy sell, right? 
The good news is I'm not really trying to sell you anything. I'm trying to lead you into God's life for you. But here's the other thing, is we don't really believe that the good life is found in Jesus oftentimes. And what I mean is that we would, we would intellectually have this assent to think that in, in Jesus is the good life, but oftentimes we're not behaving as that because we think everything else is going to lead us into the good life. See, the reason we'll choose this over, over him is because we think, man, this is going to fulfill me now. Can you really fulfill me? And I've had some conversations with God that have looked like that. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gotten that real with God, but I've gotten that real with God to go, God, seriously, I know i got to stop that. But the reality is this. This feels real and tangible and immediate, and I don't know if you do right now. And you know what I've learned through the years? When you get that real with God, he'll get real with you. He can handle it. He can handle your honest, transparent questions. And here's what I've learned, and I'm still learning. The reality is this. The good life is found with walking with Jesus and nothing else. And that's a happiness that will be with you unto eternity. A happiness that leads to real joy that the fruit of the Spirit manifests in your life when you abide with him, when you're with him, and when you lead, lead a life with him. Listen to what author Chim Chester says. I love this quote. I wrestled with this for, for a while. I've been reading this book over a couple of years. Coming back to this quote. Jesus isn't just good for us. He is good itself. He defines good. The secret of gospel change is being convinced that Jesus is the good life and the fountain of all joy. Any alternative we might choose would be a letdown. That's my challenge to you today, really. It's not the end of the sermon, but it could be. Like, don't give me the, the nice Christian answer with the cheesy Christian smile this morning. Like, search your heart for a second. Do you believe that the secret of gospel change, meaning living a holy life separate to the Lord, is really being convinced that Jesus is the good life, that he is the fountain of all joy, and that any other alternative, the chasing after the wind that you pursue, will let you down and potentially lead you to dire consequences, and for some, ultimately, to death such as the woman that was caught in adultery. I want to propose to you what true happiness is. Jesus is the good life. Surrendering everything to him and going all in for Jesus. Stop pretending to play church. Stop pretending to be righteous. Stop pretending these little things. And really lay your life down before the Lord. That takes great humility, by the way. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> you know, when you pursue a calling, there's a cost to it. In the last couple of months, I, I've been praying and just really asking the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me right now? What are you, what are you showing me? And, and there's two different places I can think of off the top of my head. In the New Testament, in um, the book of Philippians and in 2 Timothy, where Paul says, pour your life out as a drink offering. And I've just been praying, and I feel like the Lord has been asking me, are you willing to pour your life out as a drink offering? And there are days where I have so much joy, and I'm so excited, and there are days where I feel like, Lord, this is killing me. What do you have to say right now? He says, Michael, pour your life out as a drink offering unto me. You preach about eternity. You preach about being motivated for eternity. So I would suggest that you pour your life out as a drink offering. See, some of you right now are living for yourself and your own pleasures and everything that you want because you're thinking you're experiencing the good life. And you're just chugging it away and you can taste it. It's immediate on your lips and you love it and it's great. And you think there's life there, but it makes you nauseous and sick and you're going to throw it up. And there's this alternative crazy path 
with this alternative crazy kingdom that everything is flipped upside down in, where God says, this is your life. Give it to me and just start pouring it out. Just pour out your life before me. And yes, it's going to feel like you're dying at times. And yes, it's going to feel really hard at times. It's the narrow way. But here's the irony. In this whole thing of emptying yourself and giving of yourself, you know what you're going to experience? The good life. We're all destined to die. I hate to break the news to you this morning. It's inevitable. It is. But if you just live a life just being poured out in pursuit of Jesus and being with Jesus and abiding with Jesus and serving Jesus and loving Jesus as people and loving people who do not yet know Jesus, representing him well, if you just keep pouring your life out, you will live a life of purpose and fulfillment and happiness that goes unto eternity. And then you will experience joy forever, forever with him. So let me just end on this question. I'm going to cut the message a little bit short. I want to end on this on this question. I invite the worship team back up. Do you really believe that Jesus offers you the good life? That's the question I want to invite you to wrestle with today. Because I, I think this idea of holiness, this idea of happiness, I think we're dealing on the surface with some things, some fruit. But I think the root of our behavior the root of us separating from the world and going to God, I think when we start to really ask ourselves, do I really believe that Jesus, following Jesus is the best thing in my entire life? Or do I believe it's a good thing or a moral thing? Or it's good on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights? Or do I really believe that Jesus is standing here today calling me to separate myself from everything the world has to offer, even though it's immediate, unto holiness and the good life that he offers for each one of us. Would you stand with me right now? Lord, I ask this morning that you would come Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, show us each and every way, Lord, where we are pursuing the good life apart from you where we're chasing after happiness, but we're chasing after the wind. Lord, some of us here this morning may be in danger of about to reap a whirlwind of the things that we've sown. Lord, would we encounter your grace and your mercy and your justice? Would we encounter the Jesus that stands there and says, neither do I condemn you, but go and leave your life of sin into the freedom I've called you to. God, would we be a people who are captured by eternity with you? Would we live lives, Lord, consecrated in such a way where we're not perfect, we're not self-righteous, we're literally falling at the mercy of the cross, but living for you in such a way because we believe in our heart of hearts that you are the good life. You are the good life. Show us what we need to lay down. If there's any area right now you need to repent, you just do it very quietly. If there's any area right now the Lord is leading you to that you just know you need to repent from and lay it before his feet. Lay it before the cross and surrender. Lord, I've been pursuing this thing. I've been pursuing happiness in the wrong way. I've been chasing after the wind. And help me really believe with all my heart that you offer the good life.